Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we will be taking our text for the lesson uh, from there. We will begin in verse 44, or actually verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see here this uh, depiction of the wise and the not so wise servant um, in this section of scripture. So uh, first of all, as we look at this section of scripture, I want us to think about first the evil, unprofitable servant. The servant we read about that's not doing what he's supposed to. And we see that in verses 47 through 49. It says, this servant is presumptuous. He says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. The servant is presumptuous in thinking that he has plenty of time. He thinks everything's okay and he has plenty of time to do what he needs to do and to get right. You know, Satan causes people to think that they have all the time in the world to be able to get themselves right with God. The present moment is the right time to get yourself right with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 tells us, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. You know, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So you have people that think, I've got all the time in the world. I can do whatever I want to do. Uh, you hear people talk about, well, they're young. He's young. And they do all these things in their youth. And they'll grow out of that. They'll get better as they get older. It's not what Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that the time is now. We need to get right now. Because just like this unprofitable servant, you've got so many people that think they have all the time in the world. And we don't know when the master is going to return. But you also see that this person, this servant was abusive. It says he beat his fellow servants. You know, we see this a lot of times in the church. Galatians 5 verse, 5, 5 verse 15 says, But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. But people that bite each other, that fight with each other, that bicker and put down each other. And this is not the loving attitude that we are taught that we are supposed to have. You know, we as Christians have enough problems dealing with all the things that get thrown at us in the world. We shouldn't have to deal with it with our brothers and sisters. We should treat each other the way that we're supposed to treat each other. We need to treat each other with the love that we are supposed to have for each other. We are all on the same team. We're striving toward the same cause and the same purpose. 1 Peter 1 verse 22 says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. 1 Peter 4 verse 8, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Colossians 3 verse 14, But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We have to love each other. We have to love each other uh, to where we overlook some things. You know, Mike may just really annoy me today. And something he does may just really annoy me. But as a Christian, we love each other enough that we get past that, right? Because we're all, the, we're all moving toward the same goal. We're all trying to do the same things. We're all trying to glorify God and do God's will, and we need to love each other and treat each other that way. 
But then it talks about that this unprofitable servant began to walk in the way of the world. It says he began to eat and drink with drunkards. You know, many want to go in the way of the world. They want to live like the world. You know, regarding morals, our nation seems to be on this spiral. Where anything goes, you can do what you want and it's nobody's business what I do with my life. Well, you see here from this passage that that is being worldly. We can't keep one foot in the world and one foot uh, in God's court. It doesn't work that way. We either need to be 100% God's or we are 100% the world's. You know, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 tells us, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. We've got to be gods. We can't keep living like the world and saying that we are gods at the same time. And that's what this servant was doing. But we see the severe judgment that is given to this uh, servant. The judgment is unexpected. He least It's the time when he least expects it. It says the judgment will be severe. It will cut him in two. Matthew 21, 44, on whomever the stone falls, it will grind him to powder. The judgment will be the same as all, for all evil people. Notice it says, appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. He will be like every other hypocrite. Judgment will be grievous and it will be forever. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And many times after that phrase, the Lord added, and we read it this morning, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The end result is the same. And you look at this unprofitable servant. You look at the way he acted. He didn't have the love that he needed to have. He thought he had all the time in the world. And the master shows up unexpectedly. And his end is not the result he wanted. Next, let's look at the profitable servant. Let's look at the wise servant. First of all, it tells us that this servant has been appointed by his master. A wise and faithful servant realizes that his master has appointed him to be a servant. When we choose to be God's servants, that means we obey the Lord. We are truly his servants. That means we do what he tells us to do. And if we do not make the decision to be his servant, then it says we are servants of the devil. John 8, 34 and 35, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Romans 6, verse 16 tells us, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey... You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. We have to be servants of the Lord. It is a great honor to be the Lord's servant. That means we do what he tells us to do. You know, the master of this servant made him ruler over his household. It says to give him food, give them food in due season. You know, he was to give the family their food, and this food was what was to afford them true nourishment, and it had to be done in season. It had to be done when it was needed. You know, there are certain portions of the bread of life which lose their effect by not being administered in the proper season or by the proper person. We have to all exhort one another. That is dis dispensing of spiritual food to each other. We need to all give that to each other. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. 
We have to help each other on a daily basis. And if we know that somebody's going through something, we need to reach out. We need to say something. I know so many times we say, oh, I'll let that go for a little bit. Or, well, I'll handle it tomorrow. And what happens tomorrow? We put it off another day. And we put it off another day. We need to handle things with our brethren immediately because it says we are to exhort each other daily. If we are the family God wants us to be, we will take care of each other and help each other. And the story goes, becoming the first man to climb Mount Everest uh, was a dangerous adventure for Sir, Sir Edmund Hillary. After scaling the mountain, Hillary lost his footing on the way down. His guide held the line taut and kept Hillary from falling by digging his axe into the ice. Uh, the guide later refused special credit for saving Hillary's life by saying mountain climbers always help each other. We don't help each other to get any kind of special credit. We don't help each other to get any, any special notoriety. We help each other because we're told to help each other. We're told to be that lifeline to each other. You know, we should always do what we can for our brethren. Galatians 5 verse 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 1 Peter 4.10, As each one has received a gift, Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We've got to help each other out. We've got to be there for each other when they are needed. In Matthew twenty four forty six, Jesus says, You know, blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Not knowing when the master was coming, he was vigilant. He was working. He was persevering in what he was doing, no matter when he expected the master uh, to get back. And we have the lesson of the doorkeeper in Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, verses 33 through 37, it says, Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. You know, the Lord, through his parables, taught us that we have to be vigilant. And we have to persevere in our ser service to God. First Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We have to be vigilant. We have to be ready. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We also see here that great reward is given to faithful servants. You know, in verse 47, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him a ruler over all of his goods. Why? Because he was vigilant and hardworking. You know, Luke's account showed the Lord of the faithful servant will take the place of the servant himself. In Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. This means that if we remain faithful, the Lord will receive us into heaven and let us share in his glorious blessings. You know, Romans chapter 2, verses 26 through 28 says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I, have all, have, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. You know, Revelation 3, verse 21, To him who overcomes, 
I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Great honor and glory will be given to those who learn to serve in the lesser role. We have to be faithful in basics. You know, before we can shine and do more works, we've got to be faithful in the basics. That's the stuff we've got to learn and to do. That means in our attendance, our prayer, our Bible study, visiting people, teaching. Think about it this way. If your car started one out of three times, would you consider your car faithful? I would say most of us wouldn't. If your refrigerator stopped working a day now and then, would you excuse it and say it works most of the time? If you miss a couple of mortgage payments each year, are you faithful in keeping up with your mortgage? If you showed up late for work occasionally, or you skipped a day now and then, does your employer consider you a faithful employee? Look at our Lord's parables and we see what faithful service means. It was a recent survey of 287 college students. They all expressed a desire for greatness, but very, very few of them saw any connection between greatness and service. They wanted to stand out, but they didn't want to work to help others. Jesus exemplified humble service by washing the disciples' feet. We talked about in John 13, 13 through 15, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for, I, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Being a profitable servant in the kingdom means that we provide service, that we do things, that we work. And sometimes, sometimes that means getting out and working in somebody's yard. Sometimes that means, uh, you know, taking food. Sometimes that means that we just come and we follow God's will and we worship him and we study. You know, that may mean we come and sweep some floors or vacuum some carpet or put baseboards down in an auditorium. Or as of a couple of Wednesdays ago, clean termites off the wall. <laughs> you never know what you need to do, but we need to be servants. We need to be working. It's one thing I've been extremely grateful for in this congregation is this is a working group of people. This is a group of people that gives their time and their energy to do things. And so many places you don't see that. You know, the rule of thumb in a congregation is 10% does 90% of the work. And that's definitely been different here, but I think we can all do better. We can all find those ways that we can help to be that profitable servant. Consider again the Lord's application. Blessed is the servant whom the master, when he comes, will find so doing. You know, the meaning of life is not how long we live. It's not how famous we become. It's not how rich we might be. There's an author uh, to a little poem that says, You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble or you might like to dance. You may have beauty with long hair and curls. You may have riches with long strings of pearls. There is someone your service is geared toward. Is it the devil or is it the Lord? Are we doing the things of the world or are we geared and doing the work of the Lord? There was a hymn that Charles Wesley wrote in 1762. It says, A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky, to serve the present age my calling to fulfill. O oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. Help me watch and pray and on thyself rely, assured if I trust if my trust betray, I shall forever die. 
we need to put our trust in God. We need to be doing his will and we need to be workers. We need to be working. There is so much to do in the kingdom. Let's be that profitable servant that's working day and night and it doesn't matter when the master comes because he sees us doing his will and not be the other servant. If there's anything we can do, please come as we stand and sing.